Chapter Twelve of Skylark Three by E. E. Doc Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Flying visits via projection. Well, what to do? Asked Seaton as he and Roval entered the laboratory. Tear down this fourth order projector and tackle the big job. I see the lens is here on schedule, so we can hop right into it. We shall have further use of this mechanism. We shall need at least one more lens of this dense material, and other scientists may have need of one or two. Then, too, the new projector must be so large that it cannot be erected in this room. As he spoke, Roval seated himself at his control desk and ran his fingers lightly over the keys. The entire wall of the laboratory disappeared, Hundreds of beams of force darted here and there, seizing and working raw materials, and in the portal there grew up, to Seaton's amazement, a keyboard and panel installation such as the Earthman, in his wildest moments, had never imagined. Bank upon bank of typewriter-like keys, row upon rows of keys, pedals, and stops, resembling somewhat those of the console of a gigantic pipe organ, panel upon panel of meters, switches, and dials, all arranged about two deeply cushioned chairs and within reach of their occupants. Phew! That looks like the combined mince pie nightmare of a whole flock of linotype operators, pipe organists, and hard-boiled radio hams, exclaimed Seaton when the installation was complete. Now that you've got it, what are you going to do with it? There is not a control system in Normalin adequate for the task we face, since the problem of the projection of rays of the fifth order has heretofore been of only academic interest. Therefore, it becomes necessary to construct such a control. This mechanism will, I am confident, have a sufficiently wide range of application to perform any operation we shall require of it. It sure looks as though it could do almost anything, provided the man behind it knows how to play a tune on it. If that rumble seat is for me, you'd better count me out right now. I followed you for about fifteen seconds, then lost you completely, and now I'm sunk without a trace, said Seaton. That is of course true and is a point I was careless enough to overlook. Roval thought for a moment, then got up, crossed the room to his control desk, and continued. We shall dismantle the machine and rebuild it at once. Oh, no, too much work, protested Seaton. You've got it about done, haven't you? It is hardly started. Two hundred thousand bands of force must be linked to it, each in its proper place, and it is necessary that you should understand thoroughly every detail of this entire projector, Roval answered. Why, I'm not ashamed to admit that I haven't got brains enough to understand a thing like that. You have sufficient brain capacity. It is merely undeveloped. There are two reasons why you must be as familiar with the operation of this mechanism as you are with the operation of one of your earthly automobiles. The first is that a similar control is to be installed in your new space vessel, since by its use you can attain a perfection of handling impossible by any other system. The second and more important reason is that neither I nor any other man of Normalin could compel himself by any force of will to direct a ray that would take away the life of any fellow man. While Roval was speaking, he reversed his rays, and soon the component parts of the new control had been disassembled and piled in orderly array about the room. Hmm, never thought of that. It's right, too, mused Seaton. How are you going to get it into my thick skull? With an educator? Exactly. And Roval sent a beam of force after his highly developed educational mechanism. Dials and electrodes were adjusted, connections were established, and the beams and pencils of force 
began to reconstruct the great central controlling device. But this time, instead of being merely a bewildered spectator, Seaton was an active participant in the work. As each key and meter was wrought and mounted, there were indelibly impressed upon his brain the exact reason for and function of the part, and later, when the control itself was finished and the seemingly interminable task of connecting it up to the outboard force bands of the transformers had begun, he had a complete understanding of everything with which he was working and understood all the means by which the ends he had so long desired were to be attained. For, to the ancient scientist, the tasks he was then performing were the merest routine, to be performed in reflex fashion, and he devoted most of his attention to transferring from his own brain to that of his young assistant as much of his stupendous knowledge as the smaller brain of the terrestrial was capable of absorbing. More and more rapidly, as the work progressed, the mighty flood of knowledge poured into Seaton's mind. After an hour or so, when enough connections had been made so that the automatic forces could be so directed as to finish the job, Roval and Seaton left the laboratory and went into the living room. As they walked, the educator accompanied them, borne upon its beam of force. "'Your brain is behaving very nicely indeed,' said Roval, "'much better than I would have thought possible from its size. In fact, it may be possible for me to transfer to you all the knowledge I have, which might be of use to you. That is why I took you away from the laboratory. What do you think of the idea?' Our psychologists have always maintained that none of us ever use more than a minute fraction of the actual capacity of his brain, Seaton replied, after a moment's thought. If you think you can give me even a percentage of your knowledge without killing me, go to it. I'm for it. Strong. Knowing that you would be, I have already requested Drasnik, the first of psychology, to come here, and he has just arrived answered Roval, and, as he spoke, that personage entered the room. When the facts had been set before him, the psychologist nodded his head. That is quite possible, he said with enthusiasm, and I will be only too glad to assist in such an operation. But listen, protested Seaton, you'll probably change my whole personality. Roval's brain is three times the size of mine. Tut, tut, nothing of the kind, Drasnik reproved him. As you have said, you are using only a minute portion of the active mass of your brain. The same thing is true with us. Many millions of cycles would have to pass before we would be able to fill the brains we now have. Then why are your brains so large? Merely a provision of nature, that no possible accession of knowledge shall find her storehouse too small, replied Drasnik positively. Ready? All three donned the headsets, and a wave of mental force swept into Seaton's mind, a wave of such power that the terrestrial's every sense wilted under the impact. He did not faint. He did not lose consciousness. He simply lost all control of every nerve and every fiber, as his entire brain passed into the control of the immense mentality of the first of psychology, and became a purely receptive, plastic medium upon which to impress the knowledge of the aged physicist. Hour after hour the transfer continued, Seaton lying limp, as though lifeless, the two Normalinians tense and rigid, every faculty concentrated upon the ignorant virgin brain exposed to their gaze. Finally, the operation was complete, and Seaton, released from the weird hypnotic grip of that stupendous mind, gasped, shook himself, and writhed to his feet. Great cat, he exclaimed, his eyes wide with astonishment. I wouldn't have believed there was as much to know in the entire universe as I know right now, and I know it as well as I ever knew elementary algebra. Thanks, fellows, a million times. 
But say, did you leave any open spaces for more? In one way, I seem to know less than I did before. There's so much more to find out. Can I learn anything more, or did you fill me up to capacity? The psychologist who had been listening to the exuberant youth with undisguised pleasure spoke calmly. The mere fact that you appreciate your comparative ignorance shows that you are still capable of learning. Your capacity to learn is greater than it ever was before, even though the waste space has been reduced. Much to our surprise, Roval and I gave you all of his knowledge that would be of any use to you, and some of my own, and still, theoretically, you can add to it more than nine times the total of your present knowledge. The psychologist departed, and Roval and Seaton returned to the laboratory, where the forces were still merrily at work. There was nothing that could be done to hasten the connecting, and it was late in the following period of labor before they could begin the actual construction of the projector. Once started, however, it progressed with amazing rapidity. Now, understanding the system, it did not seem strange to Seaton that he should merely actuate a certain combination of forces when he desired a certain operation performed. Nor did it seem unusual or worthy of comment that one flick of his finger over that switchboard would send a force a distance of hundreds of miles to a factory where other forces were busily at work to seize a hundred angle bars of transparent purple metal that were to form the backbone of the fifth-order projector. Nor did it seem peculiar that the same force, with no further instruction, should bring these hundred bars back to him in a high loop through the atmosphere, should deposit them gently in a convenient space near the site of operations, and then should disappear as though it had never existed. With such tools as that, it was a matter of only a few hours before the projector was done, a task that would have required years of planning and building upon Earth. Two hundred and fifty feet it towered above their heads, a tubular network of braced and latticed bars of purple metal, fifty feet in diameter at the base, and tapering smoothly to a diameter of about ten feet at the top, built of a metal thousands of times as strong and hard as steel. It was not cumbersome in appearance, and yet was strong enough to be absolutely rigid. Ten enormous supporting forces held the lens of neutronium, immovable in the exact center of the upper end. At intervals down the shaft, similar forces held variously shaped lenses and prisms formed from zones of force. In the center of the bottom, or floor, of the towering structure was a double controlling system, with a universal visiplate facing each operator. "'Well, Roval, that's that,' remarked Seaton, as the last connection was made. "'What say we hop in and give the baby a ride over to the area of experiment? Kassler must have the mounting done, and we've got time enough left in this period to try her out.' "'In a moment,' I am setting the fourth-order projector to go out to that dwarf star after an additional supply of neutronium. Seaton, knowing from the data of their first journey that the controls could be so set as to duplicate their feet in every particular without supervision, stepped into his seat in the new controller, pressed a key, and spoke. "'Hi, Dottie. What's on your mind?' "'Nothing much.' Dorothy's clear voice answered. Got it done, and can I see it? Sure, sit tight, and I'll send a boat after you. As he spoke, Roval's flyer darted into the air and away, and in two minutes it returned, slowing abruptly as it landed. Dorothy stepped out radiant and returned Seaton's enthusiastic caresses with equal fervor before she spoke. Lover, I'm afraid you violated all known speed laws getting me over here. Aren't you afraid of getting pinched? Nope, not here. Besides, I didn't want to keep Roval waiting. We're all ready to go. Hop in here with me. 
This left hand controls mine. Rovall entered the tube, took his place, and waved his hand. Seaton's hands swept over the keys, and the whole gigantic structure wafted into the air. Still upright, it was borne upon immense rods of force toward the area of experiment, which was soon reached. Covered as the area was with fantastic equipment, there was no doubt as to their destination, for in plain sight, dominating all the lesser instruments, there rose a stupendous telescopic mounting, with an enormous hollow tube of metallic latticework which could be intended for nothing else than their projector. Approaching it carefully, Seaton deftly guided the projector lengthwise into that hollow receptacle and anchored it in the exact optical axis. Flashing beams of force made short work of welding the two tubes together, immovably, with angles and lattices of the same purple metal. The terminals of the variable speed motors were attached to the controllers, and everything was in readiness for the first trial. "'What special instructions do we need to run it, if any?' Seaton asked of the first mechanism, who had lifted himself up into the projector. "'Very little. This motor governs the hour motion, that one the right ascension. The potentiometers regulate the degree of veneer action. Any ratio is possible, from direct drive up to more than a hundred million complete revolutions of that graduated dial to give you one second of arc. Plenty fine, I'd say. Thanks a lot, Ace. Wither away, Roval. Any choice? Anywhere you please, son, since this is merely a tryout. Okay, we'll hop over and tell Dunark hello. The tube swung around into line with that distant planet and Seaton stepped down hard upon a pedal. Instantly, they seemed infinite myriads of miles out in space, the green system barely visible as a faint green star behind them. "'Wow, that ray's fast!' exclaimed the pilot ruefully. "'I overshot about a thousand light-years. "'We'll try again, with considerably less power.' And he rearranged and reset the dials and meters before him. Adjustment after adjustment, and many reductions in power had to be made before the projection ceased leaping millions of miles at a touch. But finally the operators became familiar with the new technique, and the ray became manageable. Soon they were hovering above what had been Mardanael, and saw that all signs of warfare had disappeared. Slowly turning the controls, Seaton flashed the projection over the girdling Osnomian Sea, and guided it through the impregnable metal walls of the palace into the throne room of Roban, where they saw the Emperor, Tarnan, the Carbix, and Dunark in close conference. "'Well, here we are,' remarked Seaton. "'Now we'll put on a little visibility and give the natives a treat.' "'Shh,' whispered Dorothy. "'They'll hear you, Dick. We're intruding shamefully.' No, they won't hear us, because I haven't heterodyned the audio in on the wave yet. And, as for intruding, that's exactly what we came over here for. He imposed the audio system upon the inconceivably high frequency of their carrier wave and spoke in the Osnomian tongue. Greetings, Roban, Dunark, and Tarnan, from Seton. All three jumped to their feet, amazed, staring about the empty room, as Seaton went on. I am not here in person. I am simply sending you my projection. Just a moment, and I will put on a little visibility. He brought more forces into play, and the solid images of force appeared in the great hall, images of the three occupants of the controller. Introductions and greetings over, Seaton spoke briefly and to the point. We've got everything we came after, much more than I had any idea we could get. You need to have no more fear of the fenachrome. We have found a science superior to theirs. But much remains to be done, and we have none too much time. Therefore, I have come to you 
with certain requests. "'The overlord has but to command,' replied Roban. "'Not command, since we are all working together for a common cause. In the name of that cause, Dunark, I ask you to come to me at once, accompanied by Tarnan and any others you may select. You will be piloted by a ray which we shall set upon your controls. Upon your way here, you will visit the first city of Dasor, another planet, where you will pick up Saknir Karfan, who will be awaiting you there. As you direct, so it shall be, and Seaton flashed the projector to the neighboring planet of Urvania. There he found that the gigantic space cruiser he had ordered had been completed, and requested Irvan and his commander-in-chief to tow it to Normalin, piloted by a ray. He then jumped to Dasor, there interviewing Carfon, and being assured of the full cooperation of the porpoise men. "'Well, that's that, folks,' said Seaton, as he shut off the power. "'We can't do much more for a few days, until the gang gets here for the Council of War. "'How'd it be, Roval, for me to practice with this outfit "'while you are finishing up the odds and ends you want to clean up? "'You might suggest to Orlon, too, that it be a good deed for him to pilot those folks over here.' As Roval wafted himself to the ground from their lofty station, Crane and Margaret appeared and were lifted up to the place formerly occupied by the physicist. "'How's tricks, Mart? I hear you're quite an astronomer,' said Seaton. "'Yes, thanks to Orlon and the first of psychology. He seemed quite interested in increasing our earthly knowledge. I certainly know much more than I had ever hoped to know of anything.' "'Yeah, you can pilot us to the Fenachrone system now without any trouble. "'You also absorbed some ethnology and kindred sciences. "'What'd you think, with Dunark and Irvan? "'Do we know enough to go ahead, "'or should we take a chance on holding things up "'while we get acquainted with some of the other peoples "'of these planets of the green system?' "'Delay is dangerous, as our time is already short,' Crane replied after a time. We know enough, I believe, and furthermore, any additional assistance is problematical. In fact, it is more than doubtful. The Normalinians have surveyed the system rather thoroughly, and no other planet seems to have inhabitants who have even approached the development attained here. Right, that's the way I dope it exactly. We'll wait until the gang assembles, then go over the top. In the meantime, I called you over to take a ride in this projector. It's a darb. I'd like to shoot for the Fenachrone system first, but I don't quite dare to. Don't dare to? You, scoffed Margaret. How come? Cancel the dare. Change it to prefer not to. Why? Because while they can't work through a zone of force, some of their real scientists, and they have lots of them, not like the bull-headed soldier we captured, may well be able to detect the fifth-order ray, even if they can't work with them intelligently, and if they detected our ray, it put them on guard. "'You are exactly right, Dick,' agreed Crane. "'And there speaks the Normalian physicist, and not my old and reckless playmate, Richard Seaton. "'Oh, I don't know. I told you I was getting timid as a mouse. But let's not sit here twiddling our thumbs.' Let's go places and do things. Whither away? I want a destination a good ways off, not something in our own backyard. Go back home, of course, Stoop, put in Dorothy. Do you have to be told every little thing? Sure, never thought of that. And Seaton, after a moment's rapid mental arithmetic, swung the great tube around, rapidly adjusted a few dials, and stepped down upon a pedal. There was a fleeting instant of unthinkable velocity. Then they found themselves poised somewhere in space. Well, wonder how far I missed it on my first shot. Seaton's crisp voice broke the stunned silence. Guess that's our sun over to the left, ain't it, Mart? Yes, you were about right for distance, and within a few tenths of a light year laterally. 
That is fairly close, I should have said. Rotten for these controls, except for the effect of relative proper motions, which I can't calculate yet for lack of data. I should be able to hit a gnat right in the left eye at this range, and the difference in proper motions couldn't have thrown me off more than a few hundred feet. No, I was too anxious, hurried too much on the settings of the slow veneers. I'll snap back and try it again. He adjusted the veneers very carefully and again threw on the power. Again there was the sensation of the barest perceptible moment of unimaginable speed, and they were in the air some fifty feet above the ground of Crane Field, almost above the testing shed. Seaton rapidly adjusted the variable speed motors until they were perfectly stationary, relative to the surface of the earth. You are improving, commended Crane. Yes, that's more like it. Guess maybe I can learn in time to shoot this gun. Well, let's go down. They dropped through the roof into the laboratory, where Maxwell, now in charge of the place, was watching a reaction and occasionally taking notes. Hi, Max. Seaton speaking on a television. Got your range? Exactly, Chief. Apparently, I can hear you perfectly, but can't see anything. Maxwell stared about the empty laboratory. You will in a minute. I knew I had you, but didn't want to scare you out of a year's growth. And Seaton thickened the image until they were plainly visible. Please call Mr. Vaneman on the phone and tell him you're in touch with us, directed Seaton, as soon as greetings had been exchanged. Better yet, after you've broken it to them gently, Dot can talk to them. Then we'll go over and see them. The connection established, Dorothy's image floated up to the telephone and apparently spoke. Mother, this is the weirdest thing you ever imagined. We're not really here at all, you know. We're actually here in Normalin. No, I mean Dick's just sending a kind of talking picture of us to see you on Earth here. Oh, no, I don't know anything about it. It's like a talkie sent by radio, only worse, because I'm saying this myself right now without any rehearsal or anything. We didn't want to burst in on you without warning, because you'd be sure to think you were seeing actual ghosts, and we're not dead the least bit. We're having the most perfectly gorgeous time you ever imagined. Oh, I'm so excited, I can't explain anything, even if I knew anything about it to explain. We'll all four of us be over there in about a second and tell you all about it. Bye. Indeed, it was even less than a second. Mrs. Vaneman was still in the act of hanging up the receiver when the image materialized in the living room of Dorothy's girlhood home. Hello, Mother and Dad. Seaton's voice was cheerful, but matter-of-fact. I'll thicken this up so you can see us better in a minute. But don't think that we're flesh and blood. You'll see simply three-dimensional talking pictures of ourselves, transmitted by radio. For a long time, Mr. and Mrs. Vaneman chatted with the four visitors from so far away in space, while Seaton gloried in the working of that marvelous projector. Well, our time's about up, Seaton finally ended the visit. The quitting whistle's going to blow in five minutes, and they don't like overtime work here where we are. We'll drop in and see you again, maybe, sometime before we come back. Do you know yet when you are coming back? asked Mrs. Vaneman. Not an idea in the world, Mother, any more than we had when we started. But we're getting along fine, having the time of our lives, and are learning a lot besides. So long. And Seaton clicked off the power. As they descended from the projector and walked toward the waiting airboat, Seaton fell in beside Roval. You know, they've got our new cruiser built of Dagall, and are bringing it over here. Dagall's good stuff, but it isn't as good as your purple metal, Innocent, which is the theoretical ultimate in strength possible for any material possessing molecular structure. Why wouldn't it be a sound idea 
to flash it into Inesan when it gets here. That would be an excellent idea, and we shall do so. It also has occurred to me that Kassler of Mechanisms, Astron of Energy, Satrazon of Chemistry, myself, and one or two others should collaborate in installing a very complete fifth-order projector in the new Skylark, as well as any other equipment which may seem desirable. The security of the universe may depend upon the abilities and qualities of you terrestrials and your vessel, and therefore nothing should be left undone which it is possible for us to do. You chirped something then, old scout, thanks. You might do that, while I attend to such preliminaries as wiping out the Fenachrome fleet. In due time, the reinforcements from the other planets arrived, and the mammoth space cruiser attracted attention even before it landed. So enormous was she in comparison with the tiny vessel having her in tow. Resting upon the ground, it seemed absurd that such a structure could possibly move under her own power. For two miles, that enormous mass of metal extended over the countryside, while it was very narrow for its length, still its fifteen hundred feet of diameter dwarfed everything nearby. But Roval and his aged co-workers smiled happily as they saw it, erected their keyboards, and set to work with a will. Meanwhile, a group had gathered about a conference table, a group such as had never before been seen together upon any world. There was Fodan, the ancient chief of the Five of Normalin, huge-headed, with his leonine mane and flowing beard of white. There were Dunark and Tarnan of Osnome, and Irvan of Irvania, smooth-faced and keen, utterly implacable, and ruthless in war. There was Sanser Carfon, 2346, the immense, porpoise-like, hairless Dasorian. There were Seton and Crane, representatives of our own earthly civilization. Seton opened the meeting by handing each man a headset and running a reel showing the plans of the Fenachrome. Not only has he had secured them from the captain of the marauding vessel, but also everything the first of psychology had deduced from his own study of that inhuman brain. He then removed the reel and gave them the tentative plans of battle. Headsets removed, he threw the meeting open for discussion, and discussion there was in plenty. Each man had ideas, which were thrown upon the table and studied, for the most part calmly and dispassionately. The conference continued until only one point was left, upon which argument waxed so hot that everyone seemed shouting at once. Order, commanded Seaton, banging his fist upon the table. Osnome and Irvania wish to strike without warning. Normalin and Dassor insist upon a formal declaration of war. Earth has the deciding vote. Mart, how do we vote on this? I vote for formal warning for two reasons, one of which I believe will convince even Dunark. First, because it is the fair thing to do, which reason is, of course, the one actuating the Normalinians but which would not be considered by Osnome, nor even remotely understood by the Fenachrone. The second, I am certain that the Fenachrone will merely be enraged by the warning, and will defy us. Then, what will they do? You have already said that you have been able to locate only a few of their exploring warships. As soon as we declare war upon them, they will almost certainly send out torpedoes to every one of their ships of war. We can then follow the torpedoes with our rays, and thus will be enabled to find and to destroy their vessels. That settles that, declared the chairman, as a shout of agreement arose. We shall now adjourn to the projector and send the warning. I have a ray upon the torpedo, announcing the destruction by us of their vessel, and that torpedo will arrive at its destination in less than an hour. It seems to me that we should make our announcement immediately after their ruler has received the news of their first defeat. 
in the projector where they were joined by Roval, Orlon, and several others of the various firsts of Normalin, they flashed out to the flying torpedo, and Seaton grinned at Crane as their fifth-order carrier beam went through the far-flung detector screens of the Fenachrone without setting up the slightest reaction. In the wake of that speeding messenger, they flew through a warm, foggy, dense atmosphere, through a receiving trap in the wall of a gigantic conical structure, and on into the telegraph room. They saw the operator remove spools of tape from the torpedo and attach them to a magnetic sender. Heard him speak. Pardon, Your Majesty, we have just received a first-degree emergency torpedo from flagship Y-427W of Fleet 42, in readiness. Put it on here in the council chamber, a deep voice snapped. If he's broadcasting it, we're in for a spell of hunting, Seaton remarked. Nope, he's putting it on a tight beam. That's fine. We can chase it up. And with a narrow detector beam, he traced the invisible transmission beam into the council room. Funny, this place seems awfully familiar. I swear I'd seen it before. Lots of times. Seems like I've been in it more than once, Seaton remarked, puzzled, as he looked around the somber room with its dull, paneled metal walls covered with charts, maps, screens, and speakers, and with its low, massive furniture. Oh, sure, I'm familiar with it from studying the brain of that Fenachrone captain. Well, while his nibs is absorbing the bad news, we'll go over this once more. You, Carfon, having the biggest voice of any of us ever heard uttering intelligible language, are to give the speech. You know about what to say. When I say go ahead, do your stuff. Now, everybody else, listen. While he's talking, I've got to have audio waves, heterodyned, both ways in the circuit, and they'll be able to hear any noise any of us make. So all of us, except Carfon, want to keep absolutely quiet, no matter what happens or what we see. As soon as he's done, I'll cut off the audio sending and say something to let you know we're off the air. Got it? One point has occurred to me about handling the warning, boomed Carfon. If it should be delivered from apparently empty air directly at those we wish to address, it would give the enemy an insight into our methods, which might be undesirable. Hmm, never thought of that. It sure would, and it would be undesirable, agreed Seaton. Let's see. We can get away from that by broadcasting it. They have a very complete system of speakers, but no matter how many private band speakers a man may have, he always has one on the general wave, which is used for very important announcements of wide interest. I'll broadcast you on that wave, so that every general wave speaker on the planet will be energized. That way, it'll look as if we're shooting from a distance. You might talk accordingly. If we have a minute more, there's something I would like to ask, Dunark broke the ensuing silence. Here we are, seeing everything that is happening there. Walls, planets, even suns do not bar our vision, because of the fifth-order carrier wave. I understand that partially, but how can we see anything there? I always thought that I knew something about rays, but I see that I do not. The light rays must be released, or de-heterodyned close to the object viewed, with nothing opaque to light intervening. They must then be reflected from the object seen, must be gathered together, again heterodyned, upon the fifth-order carrier, and retransmitted back to us. And there is neither receiver nor transmitter at the other end. How can you do all that from our end? We don't, Seaton assured him. At the other end, there are all the things you mentioned, and a lot more besides. Our secondary projector out there is composed of forces, visible or invisible, as we please. Part of those forces comprise the receiving, viewing, and sending instruments. They are not material, it is true, but they are nevertheless 
fully as actual and far more efficient than any other system of radio, television, or telephone in existence anywhere else. It is force, you know, that makes radio or television work. The actual copper, insulation, and other matter serve only to guide and to control the various forces employed. The Normalinian scientists have found out how to direct and control pure forces without using cumbersome and hindering material substance. He broke off as the record from the torpedo stopped suddenly and the operator's voice came through a speaker. General Fenimo, scout ship K-3296, patrolling the detector zone, wishes to give you an urgent emergency report. I told them that you were in council with the Emperor, and they instructed me to interrupt it, no matter how important the council may be. They have on board a survivor of the Y-427W, and have captured and killed two men of the same race as those who destroyed our vessel. They say that you will want their report without an instant's delay. We do, barked the general, at a sign from his ruler. Put it on here. Run the rest of the torpedo report immediately afterward. In the projector, Seaton stared at Crane a moment. Then a light of understanding spread over his features. Duquesne, of course. I'll bet a hat that no other terrestrial is this far from home. I can't help feeling sorry for the poor devil. He's a darn good man gone wrong. But we'd have had to kill him ourselves before we got done with him, so it's probably as well they got him. Pin your ears back, everybody, and watch close. We want to get this, all of it. End of chapter 12